Ladies and gentlemen, our second panel this morning is entitled Civil Society in Peace Building and Education. Ms. Catherine Marshall will be our moderator. And once again, we'll have 15 minutes for each speaker uh, to give their remarks. And at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. Thank you. Well, I think we will all remember that uh, first panel as uh, sort of what are we talking about and what don't we know. Uh, but given what we did know as the threads uh, that essentially link the democratization process and particularly what's happening in the world today with civil society, whatever it is in all of its manifestations, and its links to conflict, uh, we're now moving to a somewhat more specific issue, uh, which is the links between civil society, uh, peace building, and education. Uh, we have three panelists, as you can see. Um, the first is uh, Mohammed Nimer, who's an assistant professor at the School of International Service at American University. Uh, he uh, has um, works on uh, politics, cross-cultural communication, and is a specialist particularly in Islamic reform movements. Uh, and he is going to focus on the Gulen movement as uh, one example of uh, what he calls soft power and the lessons that can be drawn from that for the Arab political uh, reform movements. Uh, Bilal Wahab. Uh, from uh, George Mason University uh, is um, a specialist in transnational uh, movements, terrorism, he works on corruption, uh, economic and political transition, particularly in petroleum uh, rich countries and his experience recently, he has wide experience including with the FAO, uh, but he's focused a great deal on Iraq, and that I think will be the main uh, topic um, uh, of his of his uh, discussion this morning. And Stanley Kober, uh, with the Cato uh, Institute, uh, his theme is building peace from the bottom up. He's a research uh, fellow. Uh, he's very broad background in uh, foreign policy studies, um, and. Uh, he has concentrated a great deal on the Soviet uh, Union and on the transitions that have taken place. It's on the. Hello? Is it on again? Okay, well, with that, uh, in that order, uh, and start with Mohammed Nimer. Okay, I will. Uh, I will share my, uh, with you some of uh, my observations uh, during my visit in March to Turkey and uh, my uh, uh, encounter with the uh, with Gulen movement uh, uh, institutions and uh, uh, leaders and uh, what form of uh, uh, what form of Islam and Islamic activism they represent and what that means in terms of lessons to uh, uh, the the current uh, uh, democracy movement in uh, in the Arab world, and and so I will get uh, uh, right into it. But uh, before I uh, I move, I, I I just forgot to mention something in terms of where is the West in those revolutions. I am an advisor of the Noor Project, which is a project of the American Islamic Congress, which has an office in in Cairo. And their activists has been uh, uh, involved in the uh, in the current uh, protests in, in 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 Cairo, and so even at the grassroots level, and and, and those guys are very uh, are very much involved in uh, uh, connecting with pro democracy activists in in different parts of the Middle East uh, through Facebook and Twitter, and so even that aspect of where is us in them is is there. And uh, the, the most important thing that uh, that we've just observed uh, that the uh, that Arab people are so sick and tired of living under dictatorship, and 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 have realized that uh, freedom and liberation starts from within, that they are uh, willing to call on international community powers, powers they 
uh, uh, oppose otherwise in other important areas of policy to come and help them get, uh, uh, get rid of their demons, the dictators who rule them, who have oppressed them. And so th there is a lot of, uh, uh, I think we, we live in a, in, a, in a honeymoon period in terms of Arab-American relations these days. And so it is in that spirit that I, uh, that I look into, uh, into, the, um, uh, into, the, uh, into the topic. Um, uh, for the Arabs, Arabs have, since the start of Islam, which transformed Arab culture, um, the, uh, the idea of power, which is the starting point of my discussion, has always been Muslim versus non-Muslim. Even, um, even as, 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 uh, as, as power after the, uh, the prophet and the first guided caliphs, moved into an authoritarian form of rulership uh, with the Umayyad dynasty, uh, the intellectuals of the time choose to be called the fuqaha, the jurists, who started the intellectualism movement in the, uh, in the Arab world, um, did not ask the question, at least I'm not aware of them asking the question, is it halal, is it permissible under religious Islamic law to, uh, to gather up sub support and grab political power in a state and, and, and uh, have this as uh, a form of, uh, of, of, of rule. Uh, well, there are some uh, leaders at the time who rebelled against the Umayyads. And by uh, 50 years later, all those rebellions were quieted. And ever since, the, uh, the, the jurists have been asking the question in terms of what are the qualities of the leader? They haven't asked questions pertaining to um, the fact that there are power relations among human beings. And, um, and, and this is just the way it is. And it comes with the way we are created as humans. Um, some people who follow what I call the philosophical uh, 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 the philosophical approach to Islam, which is uh, dominant in Turkey, which brings me to the Gulen uh, ideas and the Gulen movement, uh, have asked that question. The earliest um, uh, person, the earliest uh, thinker who asked that question was Ibn Khaldun, who interestingly happened to be Tunisian. He was born in Tunis, and, um, and he called those forms of ruleships wilayat al-mutaghallib, ruled by the victor. The person or the group uh, that uh, that basically uh, rules through coercion, it can empower, uh, impose its will on uh, on the rest of society. Now, Gulen grew up in a period, which brings me to the first point I want to make: opportunity for civil society is very important. Opportunity that is predicated by the power, the existing power structure. Turkey is a military-led or a military-controlled democracy, but uh, and and it's uh, the, the 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 religion and and state choices that the military leaders, especially from the time of Ataturk, made, uh, they're still very important to the military elite. Gulen grew up in this uh, period, but Gulen grew up in a period where he had opportunity and the movement was not repressed, the, the Turkish military would uh, intervene in politics to kind of reestablish the rules of, of, of power play, and then they get out. That wasn't the case in, in the Arab world. The Arab world, uh, the, uh, the rulers, they own, they rule, uh, they exercise uh, absolute power. And that's what the Arabs now have come to uh, revolt against. And so uh, the, uh, that brings me to the question of, um, the question that was raised with are Islamists versus authoritarian rulers uh, and democratization, could it, uh, could it work? Well, now you have a new big factor. The millions of Arabs who are taking it to the street and, and they say they want to topple the regime. They don't want to be ruled by individual. This is the recent, uh, uh, the recent slogan in Syria. No for the individual, no for the family. لا للفرد ولا للأسرة. 
this is what they're saying. In in in, in fact, in in that sense, the uh, the Arabs are some sort of a ahead of Turks in that in that quest for true democracy. Yet, the G Gulen and the Islamic movements in Turkey did not have to ask these kind of questions, did not have to face those uh, realities of absolute oppression in order to come and ask uh, uh, this question of, uh, of, 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 of power. Um, what, what, Gulen has, uh, what Gulen has theorized and has, uh, uh, um, uh, has, has, has contributed in terms of Islamic, uh, Islamic thought uh, is also based on uh, not just philosophical, um, uh, the philosophical approach to Islam that he shares with the secularized, the culturally secularized military elites in, Tur elite in Turkey. Uh, but he has his own cultural choices. He happened to be a practicing Muslim. And, and, and so to him, uh, uh, he thought that uh, 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 the state should free religion. That is, the state should not uh, uh, impose uh, the religious choices on, uh, uh, on people. And in fact, what, what the state is doing, the military elite is doing, it's, imposed, it, it's, it's imposing its own uh, 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 choices when it comes to religion on on other people when it comes to the issue of uh, of the headscarf or or uh, or other uh, or other things uh, even in terms of uh, teaching religion in schools um, they do teach in religion in schools but they teach their own interpretation of what religion means and that is to the to Golan that is a form of imposing uh, a, a state imposition of religion on people. Uh, those questions are not uh, raised very much in the Arab world. The Arab world happened to come from a more of a, of a what I call a fiqhi tradition to Islam, more of a, a juristic tradition to Islam. Yet, what we've seen in the Arab revolutions, this is a major point I want to make, is that uh, the Arabs as masses are moving way beyond this fiqhi tradition, and they're going uh, more and more into the philosophical understanding of Islam. The philosophical understanding of Islam is, is an understanding that uh, organically combines understanding of reality with what people think Islamic values are, what the teachings of the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet, what they mean in their life. Um, as opposed to the, uh, what, what you might want to call orthodox or traditional or conservative juristic tradition, and, and that is approaches issues with a private republic based first on what has been written in the past about those issues. And so this is why the jurists are now playing a catch-up game with the revolts. There has been a raging debate in the Arab world uh, after the masses have taken their decision and came out wanting to depose the regimes, wanting to end uh, dictatorship, something that is still work in progress, I should say, uh, and has been pointed out before in, in the previous panel. But the, um, uh, the, the jurors started uh, asking the question, is it halal for people to come out against the, uh, against the ruler? Or is it not halal to go against them? The Wahhabis of course, for very well obvious reasons, said, no, you cannot come out. You have to listen and obey. And you get uh, uh, Qardawi going on Al Jazeera, say, well, this uh, pertains to stopping oppression, stopping vulm. And, and, and uh, uh, vulm and justice, justice, adil, are, uh, are uh, uh, predominant concepts in, uh, in the Quran, which means that uh, uh, and, and Qardawi is a, is a top uh, 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 top jurist and scholar and very well respected in um, in the Arab world uh, across different Islamic movements, particularly the uh, uh, the Muslim uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. So that is, uh, but these discussions come after the fact. The people have established by their own feet, uh, their right to, uh, to make a decision 
uh, on, uh, on on who and and and, and how, who should get to uh, who should get to rule them, and they have decided that uh, 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 governance should be based on uh, uh, popular legitimacy. And and but who are these people? Well, there there are a lot of uh, they're Islamists, they're secularists, they're nationalists, they're copt, uh, they're people who are not affiliated with any group. That's in Egypt. In Tunisia, it has its own. Uh, uh, a picture of diversity and it includes just about a lot of those there are not many Christians in in Tunisia uh, in Yemen uh, the same thing uh, uh, with the south and the north and, and the different tribes but the youth uh, the youth aspect is, uh, is is probably the common element in all these um, on all these revolutions because the youth are uh, the most to suffer uh, from oppression. They're not just suffering in terms of, uh, of lack of political rights and emancipation, they're also suffering in their own very livelihood. They don't see a bright future for, uh, for themselves. So that's, and they have associated this with the power structure. And that takes us to the, uh, uh, to the nature of the contemporary state. The contemporary state is so intrusive, something that in Islamic, the Islamic tradition hasn't hasn't known, and it is so intrusive in terms of its uh, imposition uh, of its own institutions, its own values, its own uh, uh, structures, its own laws on the various aspects of lives of society, from your birth to your death. Uh, you have to go through the state or state systems, regardless of whether they are uh, uh, ruled by uh, Democrats or, uh, or dictators. So that's, uh, uh, and that's something common between the Arabs and the Turks. Now, uh, uh, Gulen um, has, uh, uh, has, has grown in, 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 uh, in an environment where there is a great degree of uh, a democracy, um, for the civilian sector at least, um, has been able to, uh, uh, to mobilize support, has been able to build institutions that deal with the elite and institutions that deal with the grassroots. Institutions that deal with the elite are the mass communication institutions, are the uh, uh, groups like the uh, uh, Writers and Journalists Foundation uh, that, does, that acts as a, as a de facto think tank, like the Rumi Forum as well, which is part of the uh, global Gulen movement. Um, uh, and as uh, the different, uh, like Bakiyad, which is an intercultural organization, they organize uh, a Turkish festival every year in California, a huge one. And, and the show, so they show pride in Turkish culture, and so to them, uh, uh, Turkish Islam is, is the identity. Uh, uh, being Turk and being Muslim is, is the identity that, uh, that they have uh, accepted. Uh, so they, the, the Gulen movement, I would say, uh, have reconciled itself with Turkish nationalism. Um, the, in, in the Arab world, Arab nationalism was, uh, uh, was led by authoritarian groups uh, that kind of created some sort of a gap <coughs> between Islamic movements and, uh, and, uh, and states, especially at, in, at the time of Nasser, that has been kind of receding. This kind of cultural, one time, one, okay. This thing has been receding, um, which has contributed to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the growth of a pro-democracy outlook. Now, what do the Arabs, what do Arabs, can learn, what do Arabs learn from, uh, from the Gulen movement? I think a major thing is that uh, the sophisticated definition of how a social movement relates to the state, how it relates to power play. They, uh, 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 Gulen has decided, by looking at the Islamic tradition, that democracy is the best form of political system that can meet the requirements of Islamic values, the Islamic value of shura, of justice, of compassion, uh, when it comes to the public sphere. And as such, a faith-based social movement does not need and has to stay above partisan politics, above the contest for power. But as such, the, uh, the social movement 
uh, can be so powerful in the sense that I don't want to say it can be the kingmaker, but I would say it can uh, frame public discussion uh, through those uh, institutions and through those mass media that uh, the man newspaper is the largest uh, uh, distributed newspaper uh, in, in the country. And, and uh, um, Arab parties and groups have newspapers, but they've been kept down because of, uh, because of oppression, because of the oppressive regimes. And, and that's something that uh, the Turks uh, 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 probably can th think the military for. Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, Gulen would not, uh, would not uh, uh, endorse any political candidate, would not uh, get involved in, 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 uh, uh, in saying who gets, to, uh, uh, who gets to be the next prime minister, does not stop him from uh, raising his voice when it came to systemic issues of public concern, uh, the referendum over constitutional amendments. That relates to what the state is and what the definition of power is all about. And that stuff relates to, uh, to the work of social movements. Uh, the uh, uh, Ergonacan trials, the trials of the military leaders uh, uh, suspected of plotting to topple the government. Uh, he's in support of it because that is a systemic issue. Um, in the Arab world, um, at least the Muslim Brotherhood now, and uh, this is the last comment, they're, they're learning from this. And to them, the Turkish, when, when somebody invokes the Turkish model to them, uh, they refuse it, but to them, that, uh, it means a military contro controlled political system. They don't want that. But they want the Gulen inspired ideas of separating politics from social work. Um, Rashid al and this is the last thing, uh, would not give any uh, uh, answer on a political question when he is in the mosque. So the mosque is not the place for it. There have been practices and mistakes along the way. Uh, probably some of them came out in the media, more in the local media than in the international media. We can deal with it. But that's part of people learning what kind of democracy uh, they want. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, for being here. And I'm, um, can you hear me? Maybe I should get closer. Is that better? All right. Just speak to it. I want to speak to you, not to the microphone, but nonetheless, I want you to be able to hear me. Uh, well, I want to transition from the first panel and, of course, uh, Dr. Newman's presentation to uh, stick to the theme of transitions and countries transitioning from uh, authoritarian uh, political systems and uh, controlled markets uh, into the market economy and democracy and then trace the role of civil society in this transition and whether they can shape the transition or uh, uh, as Dr. Carother uh, from the Carnegie uh, says that actually the very concept of transition is, uh, is elusive because old um, systems and, and entrenched uh, interests and, and mechanisms of control uh, seem to persist only to uh, have, a, have a new face and, and, and uh, a different morph. And my case here is Iraq, and also uh, I'll talk about Iraqi Kurdistan because it's a few steps ahead of uh, the rest of the country because it has stability. So if you want to know what's going to happen once Iraq is stable, then the example would be Kurdistan, and, and that foreshadows uh, maybe the transition in the rest of the country. Um, I want to also reiterate the point of uh, the difference between civil societies and NGOs, NGOs being a component of the civil society and the, the, the latter being larger uh, uh, concept of, of movements outside uh, the government, uh, organizations of people, uh, regardless of whether they're networked, whether they're hierarchical, uh, whether they're, they're uh, uh, natural or, or, or uh, formed in the society, but at times I'll probably be using them interchangeably and I'll try to make the distinctions as, as much as I can. The role of civil society in a, in a country undergoing transition like Iraq is the role of playing another power alternative to the state power. 
and to be able to be a check of accountability on the government. Uh, in, in Iraq, this is a new phenomenon because under the Ba'ath regime, as the first panel pointed out, any form of organization outside the state was banned. Now the challenge is, right now that that monopoly has been broken to smaller monopolies, uh, what role is there for the, uh, for the civil society and these new organizations that have mushroomed after 2003. So I'll be talking about three, two themes and maybe uh, to, to get your morale down about any hopes you have for civil society, but then give you a couple of positive examples just to close on a positive end. I'll be talking about dependency, uh, and then as part of that, I'll be talking about uh, funding. In terms of dependency, Iraq is a country where dependency defines uh, its international dimension as well as its domestic dimension. Uh, internationally, its security is dependent on the existence and presence of, of foreign forces. Uh, a lot of its politics is dependent on regional politics, on neighbors, on, on foreign influences. Uh, the politics inside the political parties often are seen as stooges of, of uh, uh, powers and interests outside the Iraqi borders. In the same way, uh, this mechanism applies internally to the civil society. A lot of times, non-governmental organizations have political affiliations. And when I was working for uh, one of the USAID programs and we had to train uh, NGOs, uh, we had to be very mindful who we invite to our sessions. So we had to maintain a political balance when we invited the NGOs. We had to make sure that every political actor uh, we know that every political actor and party had an NGO or a group of NGOs affiliated to them. So we had to be mindful of, of re maintaining that balance because at the end of the day, we represented an American uh, arm of, of, of interests, of, of, of diplomacy, of development work, and, and we wanted to be politically correct. That wasn't very effective. <laughs> um, now, in terms of... Um, in terms of Iraq, and we, when we come to talk about funding, uh, the very presence of these NGOs uh, mushroomed after 2003, mostly as a market response to the availability of funds, rather than pursuing issues and seeking funding and opportunities because there is something that you want to pursue. I'm not, I'm not saying that they did not exist, but that was the trend. Having uh, put my uh, hand in the, in the mud, uh, working for uh, numerous USAID contractors. And, and this creates the dependency on the availability of funding. Now, the first panel uh, discussed how when the funding evaporates, when the interest uh, vanishes, or when there is a, a more a pressing conflict and then the, the, the focus shifts from one country to the other, uh, these NGOs uh, go home. That it does not seem to be the case in Iraq, because if Iraq has problems, and many problems, one, of the pro one, one that is not a problem is the, avail the availability of funding, because Iraq has oil. It has oil money. And that oil money is concentrated in the hands of few political parties who have been, call it lucky, or call it uh, uh, strategically positioning themselves to be able to put their hands on it. And the challenge of transition in Iraq in general, and this, this is a general point I'm making, is the actors that can manage to stay now are probably going to be there for the long haul. Therefore, what some scholars have called the resource curse, in which countries that depend on a single natural resource for their income tend to, be, tend to have dysfunctional institutions, both political and economic, uh, creates uh, a, a upside-down pyramid uh, or, or, or structure of influence in which the, the rather than the people, uh, which is the essence of democracy, rather than the government being beholden to the people, the people are actually beholden to uh, the government. In uh, just to, to give you some numbers, uh, some some 90 percent of the workforce in in the uh, Kurdistan region work for the government. I mean, 70, more than 70% of the budget is simply distributed as salaries. It's, it's, it's so big. It's basically a social system without the benefits of the independence, rather creating more dependencies. So when we apply this on, on the CSOs and, and, how, and how they're going to react to this, we're starting to see 
with the withdrawal of international funding, the government and the political parties have been very happy to step in. And, and this is a dimension of Iraqi politics. Iraqi influence and politics, when you switch on an Iraqi channel, uh, on, on any sect or any, any uh, ethnic group, a lot of times you hear about some hints of ideological and ethnic differences, but a lot of times it's about interest, it's about patronage, it's about who is better at the game of controlling others. It's, it's, some of it is smaller to the Russian compromise. A lot of it is, 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 is who pays your salary and who do you have to be uh, uh, concerned not to cross so your salary wouldn't be cut. Uh, and even if it does, which is also uh, it creates some new skill sets, then if, if X you know, cuts my salary, who is the Y that I can, I can run into? Um, so according to a National uh, uh, Democratic Institute poll, in the region of uh, Kurdistan, more than 40% of NGOs in the circle of NDI uh, get funding from the government. For now, it's only 8% in the rest of the country. But again, the trend is not going in the direction of Baghdad. It's going in the direction of Kurdistan. So with time, I'm expecting to see more and more NGOs uh, in the rest of the country getting funding from the government. And talking about government intrusion, uh, in the previous cabinet of the Kurdistan regional government, there was a Ministry of Civil Society Affairs. Sounds funny. Well, they, they got rid of it. But still, uh, there are more than uh, one mechanism for, for the petrodollar in the hands of the, of the government to be transferred to the hands of, uh, uh, of these uh, NGOs. So right now, the dependency remains, regardless of the funding source, uh, which is detrimental to the influence of the civil society organizations as a check on the government, as facilitators of, of dialogue uh, across different groups. However, despite this cynical introduction, uh, there are uh, elements of hope. Well, one, within the NGO community in particular, and generally with the civil society, which in Iraq includes the professional syndicates, uh, um, uh, some of the, the student organizations, the women's organizations, uh, that have traditionally been aligned with political parties, they're starting, they're starting to see value in independence. Some of them basically got to the habit of being a CSO, of being an NGO. It's sort of, uh, w when you do something for a long time, you get into the habit of doing it. Some of them have traveled uh, to the other uh, countries. They've seen that, well, actually, we could do a lot more than being uh, the, the, uh, the agents of a political party. So this, this sort of getting used to uh, is, a, is a factor. Another one is that politics in Iraq and politicians in Iraq, probably elsewhere as well, uh, are increasingly being accused of corruption. So people who have a project, have ideas, have concern for issues, and they want to promote it, they're, and, and they're, they're sincere about it, and there are a lot of them, are trying to find an alternative way outside the political system of promoting those affairs, those issues, those concerns. And the CSO and the NGO community is increasingly becoming one such venue. They don't want to be associated with the corruption of the government and the politics, so they try to say that we're not affiliated. And that creates incentive for more, uh, more, indefend more um, independence. Uh, to, to have a comment about USAID and how the USAID works and, and, and the funding that they, they provide, which also has contributed to this negative dynamic, and that is uh, the issue of how USAID is obsessed with measurables. How many people did you invite to your training? We trained so many NGOs and CSOs, and the measure was how many people came in, that we also created an impression for these NGOs that, well, our job is to train you, and then your job is go to train people. Therefore, NGOs, when you ask them, what do you do, they say, we train. They don't advocate. They don't see that advocacy is sort of their main concern, their main job. 
Uh, part of it has had positive effects, obviously, when it comes to education, but that's not the main role of civil society organizations to do what we were doing to them, put them in a hall like this and talk at them. Uh, another thing is, is well, the, the over-bureaucratization of, of, again, that, that, that comes in the mentality of, of outsourcing it to an NGO, and then USAID's job is to monitor that NGO, and then to monitor it from a compound, all you have to look for are something that you can measure. Uh, so, so programs that have long-term, all right, one more minute. Programs that have long-term effect often, often uh, get missed. Now, I promise to give you a couple of uh, examples of hope. Now, one of them is social entrepreneurship. And my example of that is the school where I graduated from. It's a, it's a school that, built, uh, that, that was uh, sponsored by uh, uh, Hizmet or, or uh, Gulen Merchants from Turkey in 1994. Uh, it was a free high school, uh, secondary and high school. But it established a reputation of itself because it graduated <coughs> smart students. And after that, <laughs> after that, it, uh, it started charging people for money. We're a good school. We can educate your kids. We can teach them English, Turkish, math, and science. And these students uh, can go and participate in international scientific Olympics. And they come back with prizes, gold medals, bronze. And a lot of my friends got that. Uh, so they're good they become marketable. And once they became marketable, now my sister has to pay a lot of money to, to be in that school. But that money is then invested in building another school in another town. So this process of mushrooming without being dependent on anyone, just being self-sustainable, has created a system in which you have an education system in place that goes from elementary and kindergarten all the way to a university now. And this also had uh, some of the positive effects that any CSO, and I consider universities and education systems to be CSOs, to have, which uh, Turkey and Kurdistan have always had problems regarding the PKK and, and the Kurdish nationalism issue. But they actually uh, invited about like tens, about 100 members of the, the Turkish parliament to come and inaugurate the university in, in Kurdistan. That was groundbreaking. So that is one way to create this dependency on, on political actors and, and the government, social entrepreneurship. The other one is the media, which bites very hard. And the reason that, and of course, media was trained mainly by USAID and, and the American organizations, but the reason it's more successful than the NGOs is because rather than teaching them something which is, uh, I don't want to be tainted, but, but colored by, by Western values and norms like gender equality, some of the terms that, that spare a lot of debate within, within the Iraqi very conservative community, uh, they have trained them skills. How to investigate, how to write, how to advertise. Skills that are easily applicable. And therefore, the media has been more active as a check on the government than many of the NGO uh, communities. Finally, uh, an emerging trend are, in, are national NGOs rather than regional and, and, or local, but national networks of NGOs in which people in this city find uh, people in the, in, in the south, people in the center, that we have a similar concern and we can cooperate on this. And I think that's a very positive emerging trend. Thank you very much. Sound OK? Sounds good. In 1941, an American educator, Grigor Zimor, who had been the president of the American Colony School in Berlin, published a book about the Nazi educational system, which he had been allowed to study. Hitler's schools do their jobs diabolically well, he concluded. They are educating boys and girls for death. They are preparing them as a sacrifice for Hitler. The study of war and its prevention has typically focused on international security arrangements, such as alliances or collective security. The idea is that confronted by a militarily superior force, the aggressors will back down and peace will be preserved. It makes sense, which is why it is so commonly accepted, but history shows that those who initiate wars are not so easily deterred. The Second World War illustrates the failure. Hitler was intent on war. If men wish to live, then they are forced to kill others, he proclaimed in 1929. One is either the hammer or the anvil. We confess it is our purpose to prepare the German people again for the role of the hammer. 
Ten years later, he fulfilled his prophecy. Two years after that, while still at war with Britain, he attacked the Soviet Union. And while his armies were fully engaged on two fronts, he declared war on the United States after Pearl Harbor, even though he was under no obligation to do so. In making his case for the League of Nations, President Woodrow Wilson told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, quote, that the great tragedy through which we have passed never would have occurred if the central powers had dreamed that a number of nations would be combined against them, unquote. But Hitler's actions proved Wilson wrong. Since Hitler willfully brought the Soviet Union and the United States into the war by initiating the conflicts with them. The same is true of Japan. Contrary to what, would, what one would expect from the top-down deterrence method of preventing war, the Japanese attacked us even though they knew we were militarily superior. I can guarantee to put up a tough fight for the first six months, but I have absolutely no confidence as to what would happen if it went on for two or three years. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto told the Prime Minister of Japan in 1940, I hope at least that you'll make every effort to avoid war with America. Yamamoto's assessment was very likely affected by the time he spent in the United States. He had been assigned to the Japanese Embassy in Washington and had also studied English at Harvard. At the very least, we can assume this gave him a more informed opinion of the military challenge of war with the United States. But it also raises the question of whether his time here affected his attitudes. Yamamoto's got no guts, one naval officer openly complained. He's too fond of England and America. Yamamoto ultimately obeyed his orders and commanded the attack on Pearl Harbor. But his conflicted situation raises an obvious question about another approach to peace building, one that is not top down, but rather bottom up focusing not on deterrence and balance of power, but on creating ties among <coughs> peoples. To be sure, such approaches are not new. In a marvelous letter to Lafayette, George Washington hoped, quote, that nations are becoming more humanized in their policy, that the subjects of ambition and causes for hostility are daily diminishing, and in fine, that the period is not very remote when the benefits of a liberal and free commerce will, pretty generally, succeed to the devastations and horrors of war. Washington's sentiment was elaborated a century ago by Norman Angel in his book, The Great Illusion. Angel argued that financial interdependence had made war irrational. The complexity of modern finance makes New York dependent on London, London upon Paris, Paris upon Berlin, to a greater degree than has ever yet been the case in history. Angel argued that the consequence is that no one can have any interest in war. What is a further corollary of this situation, he asked. It is that Germany is today, in a larger sense than she ever was before, <coughs> England's debtor, and that her industrial success is bound up with English financial security. Unfortunately, World War I broke out soon afterward. That war was preceded by an ugly conflict in the Balkans, and in a 1913 edition of his book, Angel clarified the illusion. It is not that the likelihood of war, which it is not the likelihood of war which is the illusion, but its benefits, he explained. It is likely or unlikely according as the parties to a dispute are guided by wisdom or folly. Well, yes, but that's a little too easy. Wars are not only about interests because human beings are emotional. Wars are not just about money because human beings are motivated by other considerations. That is why, for example, our Declaration of Independence ends with the signatories pledging our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. In discussing British behavior at Munich, Winston Churchill spoke of the importance of honor. There is, however, one helpful guide, namely for a nation to keep its word and to act in accordance with its treaty obligations to allies. This guide is called honor. At the same time, he warned that honor can be abused. Honor is often influenced by that element of pride which plays so large a part in its inspiration. An exaggerated code of honor leading to the performance of utterly vain 
and unreasonable deeds could not be defended, however fine it might look. It is precisely that exaggerated sense of honor that prompted George Washington to advise the American people to avoid making alliances permanent. He was afraid that permanent alliances would lead to the creation of permanent antipathies, and the people would then be prone to inflame trivial incidents into insults on honor that had to be addressed. Antipathy in one nation against another disposes each more readily to offer insult and injury, to lay hold of slight causes of umbrage, and to be haughty and intractable when accidental or trifling occasions of dispute occur, Washington explained. The nation, meaning the people, the nation prompted by ill will and resentment sometimes impels to war the government contrary to the best calculations of policy. Thus, to address the problem of war, we need to supplement top-down with bottom-up approaches. We have to address not only interests of state, but emotions of people. Washington made a start with that by emphasizing the importance of ties of commerce, but as we have seen, that is not enough. The Yamamoto question, however, raises the possibility of whether educational exchanges can enhance commercial ties in helping to build peace from the bottom up. Put simply, if there have been thousands and thousands of people like Yamamoto who had studied in the United States and elsewhere, could Pearl Harbor have happened? One of the great blessings of the end of the Cold War has been the growth of such international exchanges. For someone like myself, who studied in the Soviet Union, uh, but did not meet any Soviet students here. Um, and I was an undergraduate at Georgetown when I first went to the Soviet Union. Um, it is extraordinary to see all the foreign students on American campuses. And unlike Yamamoto, they are not simply studying English. Typically, their English is already good. Rather, they are here for more serious courses of study, which means they spend more time and mingle with other students from all over. The end of the Cold War also means something else. In those days, it was impossible to maintain any friendships formed. It was simply too dangerous. Now those barriers have largely fallen. In addition, new media have made it easier to stay in touch. Building peace also concerns the type of education being offered. Ziemer provides an example of the dangers of one type of education, quoting from a Nazi manual. The chief purpose of the school is to train human beings to realize that the state is more important that, than the individual, that individuals must be willing and ready to sacrifice themselves for nation and Führer. In contrast to this culture of obedience, American education, I think now, offers a culture of questioning. This is the spirit that is the foundation of scientific method and democracy. As Judge Learned Hand put it, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right. It is in that spirit that we can hope to realize Washington's vision of a peaceful world, which he laid out in, in his letter to Lafayette, built from the bottom up, in which we are all, quote, citizens of the great republic of humanity at large. Well, thank you all very much for three fascinating but very different uh, presentations and approaches to the challenge uh, that the organizers have put to us. Uh, two themes that I sensed very much are both interdependency and interconnection. And that, in a sense, is a thread, at least, that ties the focus on education and on peace building uh, and the roles the multiple roles that civil society can play. Um, Stanley, you focus more on education, but I'd be interested if uh, you would elaborate, uh, any of you or all of you, a little bit more on this theme of, of education. We focused on youth and the importance of youth uh, in what's happening in the world today, but, but how do you see 
um, civil society and education, whether it's um, non-state education or, or in relation to the state. And that's just to get everyone, everybody ready for, um, for the question period, which is the next half hour. In the context of, of um, over-dependency on the, on the state and part of the transition being breaking down the state and allowing for free enterprise, uh, education is, is key in this because when I said that the majority of the national budget goes into salaries, well the majority of the salaries are given to educators because of the sheer size and I think that also is true for the United States. But what's different uh, in uh, Iraq, which I'm most familiar with, is that education has so far been public. Everyone praises the Iraqi education system of being free. Uh, true, it is free, but it also public, which is part of the, the intrusion of the state and, and also contributes to the control mechanism. And, and regardless of who is in power, wh whatever, whoever comes to power with that amount of discretion is going to uh, create negative influences. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, bad governance, let me not just say dictatorships, are not all about intentions and personalities. They're about the incentives that pose themselves to people. So one trend, one positive trend in Iraq where decentralization of the state is happening are the emergence of private education, private universities. There are, they are at their infancy in general. Uh, uh, most of them are giving opportunities to, uh, to people who missed opportunities inside the public system. But that's a way for breaking the monopoly of the government uh, on education. And if Kurdistan, again, is any, any uh, point of foreshadowing uh, the rest of the country, then yes, it is a model for, uh, we can see in Kurdistan models for uh, uh, the private education where you have uh, Amer an American university, you have a university modeled after the British system, you have a, a Turkish university, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that many other, uh, and there's a French as well. So this creates a market for education, and of course with each university that has a cultural or a national background background, uh, those create ties with the respective countries. So uh, yes, I couldn't emphasize the role of education more, which, as I said, has been one of the successful inroads into breaking state monopoly. I, I just can say a few words on uh, education in the Gulen movement. Um, uh, Gulen's uh, idea behind uh, those 1,000 schools around the world and 10 universities in Turkey is the creation of what he calls the golden generation. And, um, and um, I visited Saman Yulu uh, High School in, in, in Ankara. It is, um, uh, and it is meant uh, for the elite students. So uh, obviously, uh, through this uh, form of, uh, of of social work, uh, y you put yourself into. Um, um, I mean, you put yourself, you step into the the domain of of of, of power uh, because you're having the brightest uh, minds in the country coming to your schools and uh, learning uh, your values as long uh, along with. Uh, uh, learning uh, uh, science and math, and, and they offer uh, top-rated uh, uh, science and math programs. So education is, uh, is, is, is very important, and in this way, that's an indirect way to uh, 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 being very uh, influential uh, social movement in, uh, in the country. So we're open for questions. Uh, please, if you could put your hand up, and the microphone is traveling. OK, I see a hand back there. Hi, it's Ilhan Toner from Turkish Press. I have a quick question to Mr. Nimer, Mohamed Nimer. Uh, is there an interest uh, during your studies? Have you witnessed any interest? I know it's still early times of the revolutions in Egypt. and. Uh, Tunisia, but have you witnessed any interesting Gulen moment uh, that, you know, some lessons that you, you elaborated here, uh, or have you witnessed any kind of engagement with the Gulen moment with these new countries that revolutions just taking place? Thank you. 
Uh, well, Golan, uh, the Golan movement has uh, has uh, schools in some uh, in some Arab countries, including. And I mean, I've been to uh, to Jordan. Haven't had a chance in my recent visit to visit the school. They have actually a school. Uh, this one, interestingly, does not serve the elite, but actually it's, it serves the uh, uh, the the bottom down. It's a, it's in a in a Palestinian refugee camp in uh, in Amman, and uh, but th there is another school in uh, in, in in Cairo. Um, the closest thing to a Gulen influence um, in the political uh, uh, restructuring of the Arab world um, uh, is probably related indirectly to Gulen movement uh, through the AK party. Um, the uh, Gulen movement and Gulen does not endorse any party, but it is not a secret that uh, most uh, Gulen members uh, vote AKP. Uh, that's uh, that's just a fact, and and so um, a lot of um, you know the Muslim Brotherhood has just decided to uh, establish uh, a political party that is completely separate from the organization, um, separate by policy, separate by organization, separate by finance, completely independent. And and some of the leaders who wanted to establish it kind of resigned their posts in the in the Muslim Brotherhood, and they call themselves uh, Freedom and Justice Party. There's a lot of uh, inspiration from the AK Party in, in, in their talk and in the way they think about the party. Other questions? Maybe comments. Or comments? <laughs> okay, good. My name, is, my name is Bowman Miller. I teach at National Intelligence University. My question is education to do what? In the sense that it seems to me that a lot of what is going on involving youth in some of the countries in the greatest turmoil right now is they have the education but they don't have the opportunity after the education. Um, creating jobs, building the economies that will in fact absorb these people once they are educated. In addition to the question about um, educating um, for faith, educating for action, educating for vocation. Um, so maybe one or, or more of you can talk to that a little bit. Okay. One of the reasons I stress the culture of questioning. We live in a now an, a post-industrial economy, which is basically a knowledge economy which is another way of saying a creation economy. It is an economy that's based on change and innovation. The people who will succeed are the people who can adjust to that. We now have machines that can remember stuff. This is one of the reasons I mentioned the questioning. I remember even, you know, being in grade school, I used, you know, exams were about memorization, okay? That's gone now. I, more, if I come to the universities now, that's not it. It's not the memorization, it is more, teaching critical thinking. That is the preparation for the future, particularly at the undergraduate level, and then I think at the graduate level, then you can specialize with that knowledge. But a lot of the world is gonna divide on this. And it's one of the, as I said, it's not only the, the language of democracy, the spirit of democracy, but it is increasingly the attitude and, and the culture that people will need in a post-industrial, world. And so that's critical. They, even if they have the degree, if they don't have that culture of critical questioning, and I've noticed that in some of the countries, Saudi Arabia now has that new university, uh, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, built on, you know, modeled on MIT, in which they are, you know, coming around to this idea that they have got to make this transition uh, to this cult, you know, education based on questioning. That I think is, is critical. So it's not just you know, how many people have the degrees, but how have they been taught? What have they been taught in that sense? A quick thing I can add is that um, in, in, in the Gulen uh, philosophy, um, Islam and modernity are not just compatible, they're intertwined. And so critical thinking and uh, a scientific uh, mind which was actually embraced uh, uh, originally by Ataturk himself 
it's something that Gulen has uh, fully endorsed, and uh, and so it is education for uh, 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 for scientific uh, scientifically minded that is also guided by uh, Islamic values, and uh, in the case of Gulen, uh, 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 Turkish values as well. Okay, we have two more, so we'll start with you. Thank you so much for that elaborate discussion. My name is Tom, and I have a slight question. When I looked at the theme for the second panel, civil society and peace building and education, my question goes to the panelists. Well, do you look at the importance of history in terms of determining civil society and peace building in some of these societies? To me, history is something that is so important to shape civil society and peace building in so many aspects. Thank you. I think I touched on it. But no. um, as you could tell from, I, I guess, my presentation, I'm very big on history, certain periods of history. Um, and it, you know, it is sort of that questioning attitude. And this is why I looked at when I was when I was taught international relations. As I said, it was all about the, you know, as I said, the alliances, balance of power. The reason I became educate, interested in the educational aspect of it, personal history here, was when I was a student in the Soviet Union. Okay? And they had a program of military patriotic education. Now, you know, somebody else here not. I, this was all, never come up in my coursework. You know, like, what is this? And I, you know, it was a program to indoctrinate the Soviet children. Um, very similar to what I just, you know, this book on the, the Nazi system. I was just amazed. It had never come up in my discussions, uh, in, my, in, in my classes. And I came to the conclusion, wars begin in people's minds. You know, and, and, and we're all so focused on the balance of power and deterrence. But if people have been trained to hate, and if that continues for more than, I say, a generation, you're going to have a big problem. Because then it's where do you get the teachers who will correct that? If it goes beyond, you know, we were able to cut it off in the, in, in the German case, you know, with World War II winning that and, you know, got rid of the educational system. But if, if you have this sort of indoctrination, if it continues for one generation, two generations, I hear talk about textbooks. You can maybe get different textbooks. Where do you get the teachers? If, there, if there's nobody left in that society to be trained like that, I, I think, this is a, a, a huge problem confronting us. But I think we have to look at history. As I said, ask some fundamental questions. That's why I bring up Woodrow Wilson. And say, it's not true. I mean, Hitler initiated war with everybody. It, you know, you look at that and it's crazy. But he did it. So there's got to be something else at work. And I look at this educational system. And I look, he was giving us the warnings, the statement from 1929. Yeah. And the hand that rocks the cradle. John Langan. Uh, John Langan from Georgetown University. I think I'll, I'll push along this same general direction in that I think besides critical questioning, there's also a need for an educational system in which acceptance of the other and a pluralism is highly valued. I mean, the Germans had a quite highly respected and influential educational system before they, in effect, destroyed parts, of the, some of the most valuable parts of it with the expulsion of Jewish professors. But um, they, they had immense scientific uh, prestige. And one of the problems is simply the reliance on the exportation of science and technology uh, without uh, confronting some of the, the larger uh, religious, ethical, and political theoretical issues um, it leaves you with a a society that threatens to become an aggressive technocracy, and in the German case, turned into be a, a very aggressive technocracy. You have touched on something, I'll, I'll elaborate, because this is something that concerns me, and this is the, r the relationship between democracy and peace and war. Because we hear our democracies. Now. Remember, Hitler came to power under um, a parliamentary democracy. Weimar. He came to power by competing in elections. He was asked to become chancellor under a coalition government. 
And within a period of few years, he had effectively destroyed the democracy. It, was, it turned out to be very fragile. This is one caution I have had about this. You know, and here again, in contrast to a lot of my colleagues, and what I sort of thought, oh, if you know, we just confronted you know, Hitler at Munich and whatever. Um, to my mind, one of the great innovations of the American Constitution is the idea of inalienable rights guaranteed by an independent judiciary. The Supreme Court saying there are things even the majority cannot deprive you of. And I've asked the question, what if that situation had existed in Germany? What if, you know, okay, the, after the Reichstag fire, the German parliament passed the Enabling Act, giving Hitler emergency powers, okay? What if there had, the German legal system, the courts, had been able to say in specific cases, no, you can't put those people in concentration camps. That violates their rights. This was an American innovation. Um, and I'm wondering, could Hitler have then progressed in transforming the society into an instrument of aggression if there had been a legal system that had pushed back like that based on the American model? It's a question, but this is something I put out. Well, there were the Japanese in California also. Yeah. We'll have this. Perfection is not the okay. point. <laughs> Uh, it seems to me that the uncertainty about the exception, uh, the acceptance of pluralism and diversity is one of the major sources of anxiety uh, for people looking at change in the Islamic world generally. Can I comment on this? I mean, I think we, we need a little education here in the sense if you just watch the, uh, what was going on in Tahrir Square, it was a celebration of pluralism. Uh, day after day, uh, uh, something that uh, the regime of Mubarak uh, have have denied the uh, uh, the Egyptians, um, the 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 Muslims uh, pray and then the Copts uh, uh, protect their backs, and the same thing with the uh, uh, with, with with the Copts as well. The um, uh, the Friday uh, when uh, the people went to celebrate the success of the toppling of uh, of Mubarak, um, the uh, Friday sermon was preceded uh, by a Coptic mass, uh, in which the Muslims and the Christians were uh, uh, were party to. I I read a um, uh, I read a statement. Um, uh, by uh, one of the youth of uh, one of the youth leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, who had been camping in Tahrir Square uh, with uh, with other youth from other organizations, from other trends, uh, leftists and secularists, and including uh, women who don't cover their hair, and uh, he he was apologizing to them. He said, "I just realized uh, that I was the rude person." that I was uh, 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 the uncovered person in my thinking of looking down at you because you don't wear the, the garment. I saw uh, the person you are way beyond the hijab where we stood together and, 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 uh, and, and fought for freedom for all of us. Uh, th that is what's going on in the, uh, in the Arab world and it involves education outside the school, on the street uh, uh, for political change. And it is uh, in, in, in involving um, uh, an appreciation for pluralism that allowed the Muslim Brotherhood now to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, establish and uh, uh, endorse the establishment of a political party, uh, some of whose founders are non-Muslim, are Christian Copts. And, and, and so there is, people are learning, education is happening, acceptance is happening. Um, now, when you take this issue uh, region-wide and you add the dimension of peace to it, there we're invoking the Arab-Israeli conflict. That's a whole different animal. I didn't want to go in it, but uh, uh, but it it requires it it requires a, uh, a a look at if Israel is to be part of this. Um, then there are things also on the Israeli side. There has to be acceptance of the Israeli side. Uh, which is not, which hasn't happened. Israelis deal with the, with the Arabs through the vestiges of power. And then there, you recognize us, then we can deal with you, then we will accept you. 
um, that argument will never stick. Because you, you want one side to, uh, to deal with education and acceptance, and the other side to deal with power. Um, it's a two-way street. People can compromise on power, but people cannot <coughs> compromise on what they think to be uh, historically uh, uh, factual. And uh, nobody said the word Israel, but it seems to me that uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is a sense that uh, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. But it, it will be addressed when the Arabs own their states. OK, we have several more questions. So the lady in the middle, then on the right, and then back to Good morning. Um, from the Association of Female Lawyers of Liberia, and I happen to be the president. And I wanted to pose the question for civil society because we do advocacy for women. As you all know, Liberia has been in a long civil war, and we advocate for women and children, especially those who are in the rural areas. And we're able to manage to do the gender and sexual based violence courts. We did the juvenile court. That's our legacy in advocacy. But my question to you is, what methodology or strategy CSO can play to ensure in government that corruption is minimized and people get most of the benefits from taxes and revenue? Thank you. That's a small question. <laughs> corruption. <laughs> Um, I'm writing my dissertation on that, so you have to wait a few more years. <laughs> um, I would say two things. Um, depending on how, how independent and powerful the NGOs are, the maximum they can do is be a check on the government and be an element of the naming and shaming when it comes to corruption. And the CSOs and the media here can actually work together uh, very closely in, in this process. And a lot of these societies, uh, this applies on Iraq and applies in a lot of the uh, African countries that I have come across in my, in my literature reviews, in which the element of shame and honor is still, is still huge, is still important. Uh, and, and if, if that, so one of the successes basically of the NGOs and the, the, the civil society in which even if they fail to institutionally put pressure on the government in terms of advocacy and advise and proposing legislations and contributing to the public decision making, they've been rather successful in the naming and, and shaming of the officials, which is influential. No public official wants his name to be uh, um, you know, on the front pages uh, every other week. So that's, a, that, that's an element. And of course, a lot of times the reaction is, is imprisoning these people. But once it becomes a power, then the, the government's uh, officials have at least to be uh, either more clever about their corruption uh, schemes or address it in, in some way. And, and the most detrimental corruption, uh, as we know, is the one that is at the top echelon. It's not the, the bureaucracy and the police cop who you know wants a ticket or, or you, you either pay the, the ticket money to the police officer or you get it later. But it's actually the top echelon, what the World Bank calls uh, state capture. Another point that I wanted to make in terms of uh, how indigenous the issues are. So you mentioned uh, women issues. So in the, in the case of Iraq, and this is, this is an example that I give, we've had a political turmoil over the word, the, the phrase, gender equality. A lot of the women organizations push for legislation that calls for gender equality. Without people even Wikipediaing what gender equality means, a lot of people you know, stood against it. Because, well, they say, what does it mean? So, well, men and women are equal. And then equal, they think about it in different ways. Huh, well, then, you know, a man can do this. So it, it, it just strikes a very sensitive nerve in the society. Not only the men, but the women as well. How about phrasing it as women's rights? That would have been OK. How about women education? That would have been right. 
everyone is for it. So just the, the very use of a terminology uh, created a lot of problems. When the term was changed into education and, and free education for, for women, equal opportunity for work, equal pay, which are all the components under the word gender equality, without mentioning the, the, uh, the G word here, uh, it, it passed smoothly. So there is a lesson for the domestic NGOs not to be beholden to whatever the, the, the guys in the compound with the money ask you for because you want the grant and you want to use the right terminology, which is, you know, uh, you, you do that in cover letters in this town as well. You have to read the bio of the company before you apply. But it's also a lesson for the donor agencies. Uh, let, let's open up. Let's see what our values and norms have alternatives, have equivalents in the society, and let, let's try to provoke those rather than wanting these people that we see for the first time to speak music to our ears. And again, this goes back to a point that I made that a lot of this is lost in the over-bureaucratization of, of aid, over-bureaucratization of development programs, especially when it comes to promoting good governance, which is a solution to corruption, and these, these long-term effects. You cannot have a project on good governance and see the results in a year. It's just doesn't happen in the same way that education's benefits are in the long run. Therefore, commitment to programs, not being very, doing them right now, but not being very hasty about seeing the results and putting them on a pie chart in a PowerPoint slideshow, I think is the, ver that the first point on the, on the uh, donor side. And then, of course, promoting more on, on, the, um, on the domestic NGOs to try to translate, culturally translate, what they want and what we want and try to, to work together. I'll, I'll just give you a very bad example about the outsourcing part in which uh, I worked with a, an ex patron advisor in uh, who came to the town and we went to meet with the uh, with the minister regarding a specific program and while we were sitting he looked up there was a big picture of a guy and the advisor said who's that point is well I mean in it, it's that part of the world wherever you go there's a picture of the leader if you go to a country for tourism you read a tourist book so read a little bit about the country that you're going to advise <laughs> Um, can I, um, I, on that question, oh, okay. okay. Just one comment. I, th I think this corruption issue in governance deserves a, a whole meeting in itself. But two, we've been surprised at how f seldom religious leaders are in the forefront of talking about corruption. And I think there are two practical points. The first one is your own house has to be in order. And the second is you have to have a fairly clear toolkit of what to do. But you're... Yes. Yes, you. Hi. Yeah, I'm really curious since you since you raised the Pandora's box about you're saying that it's an illegitimate question to start out saying, you know, first acknowledge our existence. You know, we're here, we exist. Please, you know, acknowledge our existence. That that's somehow a, a, a deal breaker to even negotiate or discuss anything. So. I mean, I, I think that's really a really troubling um, blockage. And so what that segues into is my curious concern about, since you're a big fan of Gulen, as I am, and he's about peace and dialogue and reconciliation, okay. But the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't disavow um, jihad's violent means um, for pur purification of faith reasons, um, you know, and the, the, the right to kill an unbeliever, you know, in the, in the service of the civil society that they envisage. So is there any reconciliation that you see in light of your notion, you know, I mean, I, I'm curious that they formed a political party that you think Gulen's people support, and at the same time, you're starting off from a, a launching pad where you're saying we refuse, essentially, to acknowledge the existence of Israel. I mean. Do you see that there's a, any reconciliation possible in that scenario, or do you find that that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm frankly sort of shocked. So help me here. We're uh, very close to the end. So what I'm going to suggest is that we see how many more questions there are. I know, Joseph, you have one. Um, how many other questions? Let's put about three or four more questions and then give each person uh, a minute or two. So. 
Joseph Peters over there. Yes, thank Otherwise, you we could get into this one sure. for. Thank you very much. I'm from the World Bank. Um, I, I was just wondering, in, in, in just observing what has been happening so far, is the very nature of educating not actually changing? Because uh, when I listen to the issue of unevenness of power being the crux of a lot of the conflict, um, and education being one of the possible proactive ways of addressing this. If we really observe what's been happening, we are seeing that education as we know it, um, the internet has actually changed everything. Education is, is less formal now. Access to information, access to education seem to be what the, is moving the youth, whereby the issue even of corruption, transparency is more obvious. So we're having a, a more leveling field whereby you cannot hoard information or knowledge and use it as power, but it becomes more transparent and I'm looking at a situation where if we're having greater equality in terms of education, and I think ICT plays a big role here, then the CSOs, the civil society, uh, NGOs, will be having information that is nearly about the same as the government or people in power. And that, to me, is a big paradigm shift. I, I just want to comment on this. Did you, do you, you, can you give it to her? How many other burning questions, just so I know? Okay, so one more, you and one more, and then we pass the mic. Thanks, good morning. My name is Allison Johnson. I'm an international political economist. And I wanted to dive into something that Stanley was bringing up around um, institutions and how the example of the USA and this institution and these three branches create a whole different dynamic in, in our society. And to see if Bilal and Mohammed can touch on the institutions that are being built in the Iraq example and some of the examples you've seen in Egypt as it's moving forward. Because I would like to see if we could discuss a little bit about the other folks in the region that are going to be influencing the building of institutions and the democratic structures that are going to exist in these newly emerging democracies. Number one, the influence of Saudi Arabia in the Wahhabi movement and its influence on the education across the region. Uh, what other impacts Iran may have in the building of institutions across the region and how that contrasts with perhaps some of the Western civilization uh, institutions that may be pushing in that uh, democratization process. Uh, and finally, if it's possible, Stanley, to just touch a little bit um, as you push on this issue of the rule of law, the importance of our, judici our judicial branch, um, the extent to which that kind of institutionalization can be um, imposed from the outside. In other words, you know, the USAID, the Department of Justice, they have lots of programs to again bring that institution into the rest of the world. Um, is that possible or is that something that has to be from the grassroots, from the bottom up, to want to have institutions based on similar rules of law that we've built in Western civilization? Thank you. The last question at the back. And then you each get a minute, I think. Hi. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about sort of crisis in American education. Um, and there's also been a lot of really bad mistakes that Americans are making in terms of Islam. Book, book burnings, burning the Quran, uh, voting against Shira law without really um, knowing what it is. Uh, George Bush didn't know that there was a difference between Shia and, and Sunni. Um, so we're, you know, we're teaching people to do business and technology and medicine and all these other things, but no one wants to fund history, philosophy. Uh, Americans are very bad at geography. So, you know, who needs the humanities? They're not money makers. Let's get rid of them. But it turns out that without study in, in the humanities, we have a completely distorted view of the Islamic world. And so public opinion formation about our MENA policy is, is distorted by this. It seems very dangerous. And I wonder if anyone's looking into and trying to frame a solution to this crisis in American education where it's, it's not just run on a business model, but for business purposes, 
at the expense of of, uh, of an informed public that that knows anything about the about the Middle East. Um, I'm, I'm going to comment on the issue of, of transparency as one one solution, one of the solutions uh, to to corruption. Yes, indeed, empowering the public is uh, is is one of the the most important counterbalances to to powers of of, of corruption. However, we're talking about uh, a people that once they know, they can act on it. Transparency assumes that corruption happens because people don't know, and then if we let people know about what their officials are doing, that they're going to do something about it. But in some of the examples that, that I talked about, if the dependency is that heavy, knowledge is not going to change much. Knowledge would not lead to action, would not empower. Naming and shaming may still remain, but I've heard Iraqi officials say that the media has the freedom to speak and we have the freedom not to listen. <laughs> it's a challenge. Therefore, relying on only one tool uh, is not going to, to be enough. And the, in, in terms of institution, to just very briefly address it, yes, in, in the case of Iraq, uh, there are the right institutions in place uh, in the appearance. But just in the way that the American history has had power struggles between the three branches of the government, in which you know, at times the executive, well, increasingly, the, the executive has, has been gaining and wielding more power versus the two others, a, a pattern is emerging, emerging in Iraq uh, as well, in which a lot of the independent commissions, like the Commission of Public Integrity, which fights corruption, the Election Commission, uh, and right now the, the, the commission that is supposed to be independent, bound to the parliament, and fund the NGOs have all been taken under the arms of, of the government, which takes me back to my presentation in which actually there is a clause in the in the non-governmental and civil society funding law that the, key, the, the Kurdish government passed that says that the government will fund organizations based on their projects and will then hold them accountable on how the money has been spent. I think this panel was about how the NGOs and CSOs can hold the government accountable. But I'm telling you about a law that requires the government to hold the CSOs accountable. So institutions can go only that far. On, on the rule of law, um, when the Cold War was ending, I was really amazed to see these articles in the Soviet press. Um, on the rule of law state, Gorbachev described perestroika as a legal revolution. And he said it was based on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, and this is what I was seeing in the, I don't know the Gorbachev, but I saw this in the Soviet literature. And the book that came up all the time was Kant's essay on um, the rule of law state. Um, and one thing in particular affected uh, the Russians during that time, and this is the legislative control over the war power. I began to see articles on that. First of all, human rights. They began to say that they had been wrong on the issue of human rights, that no country could say that its domestic situation was immune from international human rights standards. I found this extraordinary at, at the end of the Cold War. They were openly admitting we were wrong. Um, those days are gone, by the way. I don't see that anymore. And similarly on the war powers. I remember seeing uh, an article in Communist, the leading journal of the Soviet Communist Party, it, which, which uh, was arguing that uh, the, uh, Russia had nothing to, the Soviet Union then, had nothing to fear from countries that had legislative control over the war power. Because as the Vietnam War demonstrated, once a war got to a certain level, the legislature would intervene and put a stop to it. And any war against the Soviet Union would be so big. And then you saw these questions about how did we get into Afghanistan without the Supreme Soviet? Just a few people starting it. And when Gorbachev was sworn in as president of the Soviet Union, he said from this point onward, the, the president cannot on his own authority send the armed forces outside the country, you know, to attack another country. It would be under the legislative control. Those days are now gone. Um, I, I find this a great tragedy. The one hope I have here, and this is one of the reasons I made the reference to the students now studying other, th other things. Um, I am amazed the last few years how many Chinese students I meet studying law to coming over here. Um, this, I, I, I don't think this has received enough attention. Why are they studying law? 
to come over here and study. You know, every year I go to reception at the State Department for the Washington Foreign Law Society. It's a nice reception. I invariably meet at least one Chinese law student. I, and, and just, you know, in meetings around town. So that, I think, is an interesting observation about where China uh, may be heading. Okay, well, um, very quickly on the role of uh, new uh, institutions. I think some, uh, some institutions, uh, a lot of institutions exist there, especially like in the case of Egypt, they just need to work right. Uh, i tell you, um, I met with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the director of the elite uh, uh, Egyptian think tank, the Ahram uh, Center for Strategic and uh, Political Studies. Uh, two months before uh, January 25th, um, where he told me that, uh, oh yeah, if the, Dem if the National Democratic Party would run and they were about to run for election, that was the rigged election, they're going to get uh, they're going to get a majority uh, uh, for sure. And of course they did, uh, but they they got a majority. I said, well, even if they're not uh, under the tutelage of the state, he said, yeah, they would get. Uh, uh, overwhelming majority on their own. Now this guy, after the after the the same person, is a nice person, uh, accomplished intellectual and writer and, and a researcher. After the revolution, he turned into a a pro democracy analyst, and um, and and so the the institutions and the intellect is there. They just need to work right and without oppression, without uh, the, uh, uh, w without this, uh, uh, w without dictatorship, they can work right. Some institutions need to, uh, 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 t to new institutions need to be established, and the Golan movement uh, experience is instructive. Those intercultural uh, programs, um, um, Arab groups, and uh, again, because of oppression, they were not able to communicate with each other. They were not able to uh, to do cultural programs where where Copt and Muslim can meet, and so now this is happening. After after the uh, uh, the the uh, uh, departure of uh, of Mubarak, and uh, a lot still needs uh, a lot still needs to happen. But uh, I'm sure people will find a way. On the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, Israel, I, I, I didn't even talk about uh, existence and uh, I mean, issuing any conditions on, 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 on dialogue about uh, recognizing anybody's existence. Um, I was just addressing the issue of uh, uh, that uh, education on, on pluralism and acceptance of the other um, uh, needs, to, uh, needs to encompass everybody, uh, including the Israelis. That's, that's all I was talking about. Well, thank you all to, uh, to the panel and to all of you who raised such interesting questions. Clearly, this is a discussion that's just begun. So thank the panel and move on to the next. Question.